This is Oramen Lamar. She's a grandmother, she supports a family of six, and five years ago during the earthquake in Haiti, the front part of her house collapsed. Along with her family, she moved to a tent camp and they spent two years not knowing when they would able, be able to move back home. So lucky for Oramen, her house was in a neighborhood that was targeted for rehabilitation and a Dutch NGO called Cordaid offered her a subsidy to retrofit her house, provided that she received technical assistance from Build Change, which is the organization I work for. And so Oramen actually got to participate in the design of her house. She sat down with Build Change's engineers, she told them where she wanted the kitchen to be and where she wanted the bedrooms to be. And she was adamant that we rebuild this veranda because it's the part of the house that she uses for her sewing business. And so you can imagine that trying to convince some engineers to rebuild part of the house that would have collapsed was difficult, but Oramen really was relentless, and in the end, we were able to give her what she wanted. So Oramen got money directly from Cordaid. She was the one who purchased the materials. She was the one who hired the builders. And in less than two months from the start, her house was retrofit, her family moved back in, and she was re able to restart her sewing business. So. Why do I mention Oramen's story to you? Well, I really think it's a great example of a cheap, effective, but also culturally appropriate solution to a man-made problem. And what is that man-made problem? Well, it's the 200 million people who are living in vulnerable housing worldwide. As you can imagine, these people aren't living here in Japan or really anywhere in the Western world. They're living in emerging nations, and they're dealing with disasters like earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, tsunamis, typhoons. They live in houses like this. So there is a solution. There are many solutions to help these types of people, but one solution that we're promoting and advocating for is to retrofit these unsafe houses. And I want to be clear about what retrofitting is, because it goes beyond a simple repair. Retrofitting is actually tied to a building code, so there's an intended level of performance during a disaster. For most houses, this means you're gonna preserve the life safety of the people that are inside so that they can get out. And for buildings like schools, it actually goes a bit further, so typically it's safe for people to stay inside a school during a disaster. You do hear a lot about post-disaster retrofitting programs, stories like Aura Men's, but we don't hear as much about pre-disaster retrofitting programs, which is a shame because you can retrofit houses like these before a disaster to keep the families that are inside safe as well as their neighbors. So how do you implement a successful retrofitting program? Well, you need three things. You need money, you need technology, and you need people. I'm gonna take them one by one. First with money, simply put, if people don't have enough money to build a safe house, they will not build a safe house. So enough money needs to be made available. Second on technology, the right technology needs to be accessible to people, which means it needs to be centered on the existing culturally preferred ways of building, but with small changes to improve the safety. And last on people, somebody needs to want this house to be safe. Or if you're retrofitting a school, someone needs to want this school to be safe. It's the homeowner, it's the school group, it's the government, it's the financer, but someone needs to be pushing for it. So I think you can see how these three are all linked. Really, you can't have money and technology without people, or you can't have people and money without technology. But when you have all three together, you're armed with the tools, the resources, and the mandate to promote the safety of housing and schools worldwide. This can really, literally impact millions of people. So. What I'd like to do is take these concepts of money, technology, and people and bring them back to retrofitting. So first, let's talk about money. Yes, you need enough money to build safely, but the cost also has to be competitive with the existing but unsafe ways that people are building now. In a pre-disaster setting, or a post-disaster setting, pardon me, retrofitting almost always comes in cheaper than Demoli doing demolition with a damaged house and then rebuilding it. Unfortunately, in pre-disaster settings, it's much more difficult. Retrofitting is typically more expensive than repairing or upgrading because you're using either better quality construction materials or just more construction materials. But I do think there is an opportunity here, and it's actually on two fronts. The first is with the materials themselves, because we can leverage the private sector. 
the private sector can offer discounts or subsidies on their materials in exchange for preferential market access. So think about it, a cement company that can access tens of thousands of people that they wouldn't previously have had access to. And let's take a look at Bogota. Can you imagine these tens of thousands of people living in vulnerable housing that retrofit their houses with good quality cement? That to me is a win-win scenario. And the other opportunity is on a policy level. I'm sure you guys have heard this repeated over the last few days. Every single dollar invested in disaster risk reduction saves seven more in disaster response and recovery. That is huge, and that has to be enough to convince every, any government to invest in disaster risk reduction. And in Guatemala and in Colombia, they actually already have. These governments offer subsidies directly to homeowners to retrofit their houses. And there are other ways of doing it. In the Philippines, the government's offering a housing loan partnered with technical assistance. It's a program similar to Oram en la Maus, and then people can build safely. So let's remember money. You need enough money to build safely, but that's the first tenant of the money technology people paradigm. And the second, of course, is technology. So I said earlier, your technology needs to be culturally appropriate. There's no sense in trying to teach someone how to build an igloo if they're going to be living in a concrete house their whole lives, right? What we need to do is make small changes to the existing construction practices. No cost, low cost changes, really. Sometimes it can be as simple as just bending a bar a bit further or using nails, enough nails spaced in the right areas. Retrofitting isn't something crazy. It's not this difficult technology that you need a bachelor's or a master's, a PhD degree to implement. And so what it really centers on with technology is training. We need to be training every single people in the construction value chain, from the engineers and the architects that are designing houses, the government officials that will be inspecting them, from the um, builders that are actually going to be building them, like you see here, and we need to put this curriculum into vocational training schools so that governments and communities are effectively training themselves and this gets institutionalized. And the other thing we can do is train homeowners. So when Aramen received her subsidy, she also received training on basic construction principles. So she actually learned why part of her house collapsed while some of her neighbor's houses didn't. She learned what good quality construction materials look like so she could go out and buy them herself. And she learned these basic tenets of safe construction so she could watch her house being built. And in the end, she felt safe that her house was going to keep her safe in disasters because she knew the measures that were taken for this safety. And so the lesson here is really that we've got this opportunity to engage people who wouldn't otherwise be in the construction process, but to promote messages of safe construction and that information is gonna get diffused. So let's talk about people now. I did say earlier that somebody needs to want the retrofit, and that's true. But what if somebody doesn't want the retrofit? What if they're worried about land tenure? What if they're worried about site safety? Honestly, I could give an entirely different talk about site safety, about relocation, the politics surrounding that. I don't have the time to do that here. But I will say that there are options out there to mitigate risks for site, things like using retaining walls or gabion baskets, and this is something to consider. What I do want to talk about briefly is land tenure because this is something that Build Change has experience with. So we found, for example, that with retrofitting, because it deals with an existing house, in the case where the government doesn't require a permit to repair the house, they're also not going to require a permit to retrofit a house, even though it is a structural solution to make a permanent change. And in these cases, or in cases where land tenure documents don't exist at all, we still find it's effective to get validation from the community about the homeowner's plot. So even in informal settlements, people often know who their neighbors are, how long they've been living there, and what the boundaries of the plot are. And this can often be enough for governments to validate land tenure. Now, let's talk about the other elephant in the room, which is how do you actually get people to want this? <laughs> how do you create demand? Um, on the government level, I want to t go back to what we're talking about, which is, of course, every single dollar invested in risk reduction saves more in disaster response and recovery. This is a really powerful argument, and it's got to be enough to convince governments to um, support retrofitting programs. 
The other people we need to convince is, of course, the financers, whether it's the private sector who's going to be providing loans for retrofitting, or homeowners or NGOs that are providing grants. So for the private sector, again, we talked about tying it to market access. And so banks, insurers, construction materials manufacturers, any organizations that are involved in the construction value chain have an interest in retrofitting because it can be economically profitable for them. And NGOs have an interest as well because retrofitting programs create jobs, they build skills, and they promote livelihoods. And we know that all of these are indicators and can bolster the resilience of a community, which is important. And the other thing is the homeowner. So how do we get the homeowner to want a safer house? Obviously, after a disaster, it's easy. The demand is created for you. But before a disaster, how do you convince someone to use their own money, whether it's loans or savings, to actually go out and retrofit their houses? Well, I think there's a few ways to do this. For example, raising community awareness about safe construction practices. I've been hearing over the past couple of days tons of innovative ways to go out and spread messages. You can send SMS blacks. You can use community theater. You can create radio songs and get them out there to spread the message. So let's take advantage of these innovative ways to get the message out. Another thing we can do is take advantage of that time after a disaster when people are feeling vulnerable to let them know that there are measures they can take in order to increase the safety of their houses that are permanent. I do think that organizations and governments do a good job of implementing DRR into their disaster kind of recovery and response, but unfortunately few have the money or the mandate to actually integrate disaster mitigation into more permanent housing solution programs, and so more money does need to be dedicated here. And the last thing to do is to put the homeowner in the driver's seat and let them know that they can drive the process. To be honest with you, I don't think that Oremen Lamar would have retrofit her house had we made her block off for her veranda, because that's the part of the house she uses the most. She needs the natural light for her sewing business, and to her it's almost like a form of advertising to be sitting there away at work and having her neighbors in her community see what she's doing. But we were able to design a retrofit that met Oremen's needs, and in the end she feels like the house is not only safe, but that it's hers. And that, I think, is really important. So whoever you are in the audience, whatever type of organization you're representing, whether it's a multilateral, the private sector, an NGO, a government, I do hope that I've given you some food for thought on how you and your organization can be involved in promoting and scaling retrofit programs. I would be very happy to answer any questions now or offstage. My name is Kate Landry. I'm with Build Change. And thank you for lending me your ear.